Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, regular scheduled Tabor Town Council meeting for July 20th, 2020. Uh, first off, call the meeting order and ask for an adoption of the agenda as amended related to an activity report just submitted here. So, somebody want to make that motion? Councilor Stravas? Your Worship, I'll make the motion that uh, that we uh, adopt the agenda uh, as amended. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. And just for the record, uh, Councillor Firth is unable to attend today. On to item number three, adoption of the minutes. Item 3.1, Minutes Regular Council meeting June 22nd, 2020. Mr. Arnfield. As usual, we have the last scheduled council meeting minutes up for your consideration at this council meeting. June 22nd is the date of the previous council meeting for your consideration. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? So I'm prepared to make that motion. Councillor Tams. Mr. Mayor, I move that council adopts the minutes of the regular meeting of council held on June 22nd, 2020 as presented. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. On to item four, business arising. There are none. Item 4.1, 64th Avenue stormwater upgrades. Mr. Rimfeld. Yeah, Mr. Shear has walked up. It's good timing. Uh, as you know, we've been working on this matter along 64th Avenue and um, Mr. Shear can share some of the research that he's done with regards to quotes and uh, you know, timing on that job potentially. All right, thank you, Mr. Shear. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we, from the last council meeting, we actually went out, designed the concept of fixing up this area, uh, regrading the ditches, supplying new culverts, additional culverts. Some of there was basically the the grades weren't set right. That was a big part of it. So once you did redo the grade, the, the grades. Then we got to put topsoil, seed it all again. So we went out and got a couple of estimates, you know, one from Ground Tech and one from RCB, both very close together, so we know it's a good project. Um, engineer's estimate, what we thought was quite high at 130, actually came in at, at uh, 60,000, say. So we're asking council if you want to move forward with this project to ask for 75,000, a little contingency and a little bit for engineering. So uh, and the council has options to accept that or move it into 2021 capital projects. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? Councillor Brown. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, question, can we afford to do and do it in 2020? Do we have room in the budget or how is that picking well, into our plans? If we look at our next tender I have coming up, there's actually that saving, the almost exact saving there. Mr. Thomas. Like in next year, there's the same oh. savings of what we're spending today. In the 2020, Street improvements. If you approve it today, it's in the agenda. Yes. Councilor Strauss. Worship, I'm ready to proceed with a motion that Council directs administration to add 64th Avenue stormwater upgrades project to the 2020 capital budget for the amount of $75,000, with funds to come from the capital reserves, and awards the 64th stormwater upgrades project to Ground Tech Enterprises for the amount of fifty nine thousand four hundred nineteen fifty, inclusive of GST. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item 5, bylaws. Item 5.1, bylaw 11, 2020. Municipal Development Plan Amendment. Mr. Armfield. Yeah, Ms. Mounts will be making her way up. Uh, as you know that we've taken over the properties west of 864 and that required a change to our mapping and our municipal development plan for the intended land uses of that area and Miss Monks has prepared those in a bylaw and she's <coughs> ready to go through that with council now. All right thank you Miss Monks. Yes good afternoon your worship and members of council. Um, a lot of this Mr. Armfeld has indicated but administration has been working on amending the maps for the municipal development plan in order to include the annexed lands and to provide for future development and land use as is required under the Municipal Government Act. At the February 24th, 2020 regular meeting of council, resolution 100 2020 was passed directing that this work be completed. So at this time we've amended maps one through nine for the existing municipal development plan. Not only has the annex land been added, but we've also added updates to all of the mapping to accurately reflect any future transportation or servicing plan that um, we had already had underway. So council may review these proposed maps and provide any input or direction for amendment. Map three is the proposed future land use strategy that will be of interest to council. Administration is currently proposing institutional recreation for the town owned parcels within the annexed area. 
The privately owned parcels have been designated as rural small holding. The land use bylaw will provide for more specific uses when that, that amendment comes forward. The rural small holdings parcel will further be designated as rural agriculture or rural urban fringe, which is their current land use as per our annexation agreement with those landholders. Town lands could either be designated institutional recreation district or potentially an urban reserve district, depending on what council wanted to see there. These further classifications will be determined with the land use bylaw amendment that is tentatively scheduled for first reading at the August 17th, 2020 meeting. So for this MDP amendment, the next steps um, are that the impacted landowners will be circulated. An ad will be placed in the Tabor Times, providing a link for the public to review the mapping. A public hearing will be held, and then council will be in a position to provide second and third reading if the maps are to your satisfaction. So at this time, administration is seeking council input and direction, and will begin the public notification process once council has provided first reading of the bylaw. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? Someone prepared to make a motion? Councillor Gurner. Your Worship, before we... Oh, Councillor Chavez. A, a question before we proceed with, I don't know if you're going to make a motion right now. I believe he was indicating well, that. Too. Yeah, I, you I go just, ahead. I just you have, have a, a question because I brought up in, in a meeting previous about uh, about uh, breaking up some of that land for for agriculture. So there, uh, to the administration, whether it be still time to adjust that in the next readings or is that the time to bring it forth at this time? So through His Worship, um, if we designate the lands as institutional recreation on this kick of the bylaw or the MDP amendment, that can still further be broken down at land use um, into an agricultural type use. If we if we were to designate it as urban reserve district, it does allow for some agricultural holdings to be included in there. So the urban reserve district could still fall within the um, institutional recreation under the broader scheme of the MDP maps. Okay, great, thank you. Councilor right, Garner, you're prepared yes. to make that motion? Yes, Your Worship, I'm prepared to make a motion at this time. The Council gives first reading to bylaw 11-2020 as presented. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Excuse me. Councilor uh, Towns. Isn't bylaw 7 2016 or amendment? Doesn't that have to be included, Mr. Armfeld? Uh, you'd have to read back the recommend or the, the motion that was. Uh, I, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the, your asking. He, he's asking bylaw 2020 municipal development to bylaw, but it, it includes another bylaw. Through his worship, if I may, Mr. Armfeld. So, bylaw 11 2020 is an amendment to bylaw 7 2016. So, by passing bylaw 11 2020, then it further approves that amendment because we are only amending the maps. So, we weren't going to revoke or rescind the other bylaw. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're all clear on that. Okay, very good. Uh, once again, motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Item 5.2, Bylaw 14-2020, Long-Term Bore and Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Armfield. Yeah, I'll get Mr. Orwa up to the front, if he may, and discuss the next couple uh, borrowing bylaws with Council. Mr. Orwa. Thank you very much, members of council. So before you is uh, bylaw number 142020, that is the long-term borrowing for the Chamber of Commerce uh, building project. Now, as a requirement under the MGA, uh, an advertisement must be posted in the newspaper for two weeks. That's just for your information. So the administration is just requesting uh, for the first reading so that we can process the rest as per the MGA. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? Councillor Beckering. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through to Mr. Orwa, what's the current rate under Alberta Capital Finance Corporation, please? Uh, for this particular bylaw, when I, when I processed this one, it was 2.03%. And previously, the, it was 2.1%. It looks like it's coming down. And my hope is by the time we're passing the application, it might even go lower. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. 
Any other questions? Some are prepared to make that motion. <coughs> Councilor Becker? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move that uh, Council gives first reading to long-term borrowing Chamber of Commerce building project bylaw 14-2020 at this meeting. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 5.3, long-term borrowing 56th Avenue Road Extension Project. Mr. Armfield. Yeah, similarly, Mr. Orwa, will you run us through this one? Very much again. Uh, so this again is another long-term borrowing, and uh, we are going to process them almost at the same time. And this is for 56 Avenue Road Extension as per capital uh, projects that were approved by council. So again, this one will also go through you know the same process of uh, two weeks advertisement, and then we wait for uh, a petition period. If there is nothing, then we put in the application. And again, um, we're requesting council for the first reading to allow us to go through the same process of uh, advertisement. Great. Thank you. Any questions, Councillor Bruin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just uh, like to make the motion that council gives first reading to long-term borrowing 56th Avenue Road Extension Project Bylaw 15-2020 at this meeting. Great. Thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? Councillor Becker? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through Mr. Orba, uh, mm -hmm. if you apply for these two loans at the same time or virtually the same time, is there a volume discount? Question. Would there be a volume discount from Alberta Capital Finance Authority if you applied for two big loans at the same time? Simple answer is no. Okay. No, no discount. But it will be going at the same rate. What that does is, the only thing that it does is, it gives us enough time now to look at uh, the, the, the debt limit at the same time. Sure. All right, thank you. Once again, motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried now. Thank you. <clears throat> on to uh, item six, action item 6.1, strategic plan reporting 2020, Mr. Armfield. Yes, I, I'd like to introduce this. Uh, to council, there is a report attached that uh, Ms. Brennan has put together, and uh, if there's any questions, we can you know we can discuss those questions with regards to the attached report. But specifically, what I would like to talk about is the amendment that we're requesting with regards to the language in the strategic plan related to business plans versus operational plans. The business plan concept has never really <clears throat> found its wings and taken off because it was a little bit too nebulous, I think, to a lot of us in administration defining how do you create a business plan in a municipal environment? We're not running a business. Um, what we can all appreciate and what we have all discussed internally is what would be included in an operational plan. And there would be a number of benefits to creating those operational plans uh, year to year with identifying what you know our labor pool is actually going to be doing one year to the next and then allowing us to actually record um, council knows that we are moving forward with a new time tracking software so w your administration is going to be able to have the ability to forecast what each of these tasks are you know going to take uh, forecast timeline but then with this new software we're actually going to be able to get the actuals to know exactly what these things take for time. So if you, as an example, are replacing a fire hydrant, um, there's a suite of fire hydrants that gets replaced every year. Public Works, they know that they have to do that work. They have a pretty good estimate of timing that they know that it's going to take. Uh, so we know what that operational cost is to the municipality. But we've never been able to reconcile it between the forecast cost and the forecast time and the actual time that it takes. Now with this new software, we will be actual to identify when um, our labor pool is out working on things, exactly what they're spending their time on and the exact cost to the municipality. And then we are going to be able to benchmark ourselves with other municipalities that have similar data to make sure that what it costs to replace a fire hydrant, for example, in the town of Tabor is similar to what it costs to replace a fire hydrant in the city of Lethbridge. And if there's a difference there, we will be able to look into and research as to why that is. So it may seem like a very minor language amendment going from business plan to operational plan, but the way that we um, are looking at that internally is that uh, it actually is significantly more for us um, 
in that planning cycle and that knowing what people are doing day in and day out and then reporting that and using that as a performance management metric. So if a director is committed to a certain operational plan throughout the year, um, we can have a conversation on why those things cost more than they were forecast to and why things didn't get done on that list that were proposed to be done on that list. So there's a number of accountability standards that we can go forward with now that your administration is prepared to. And with that, that's my um, request. It's kind of building my case for requesting that change in language and uh, happy to answer any questions that you have with regards to that report. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? <laughs> Councillor Thames. No, Mr. Mayor, I, 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 I like that. I'm prepared to make a motion. All right, fair the enough. Council accepts this strategic plan 2020 report for information and that council amends the phrasing of business plans in quotation marks in the strategic plan to operational plans in quotation marks all right thank you motion on the table <coughs> any further discussion all in favor carried now good thank you item 6.2 purchase of electronic tablets mr armfield I believe yep miss lace lutz is going to come up and uh make a case for buying some tablets for the Arts and Heritage Committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. The Arts and Heritage Committee had their first meeting on June 16th. As a new council committee, three of these representatives do not have tablets. These are recommended to better access agendas, emails, and other supporting documents. At the meeting on June 16th, a motion was made recommending that administration request funding from council's discretionary fund for the purchase of three electric tablets electronic tablets for the members at large on this committee for no more than $2,500. All right, thank you. Any questions whatsoever? Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Garner. <clears throat> I'm prepared to make a motion at this time that uh, council directs administration to purchase these electronic tablets for a maximum of $2,500 to be funded through the recreation operating budget. All right, um, Councilor Towns. From the Council of Discretionary Fund or from the Recreational Operation Budget? Recreational Operating Budget. I guess we would need some clarification on that, Mr. Arnfeldt. Uh, yeah, that was suggested for the, the um, Council of Discretionary Fund. I believe there is money available there, but it's certainly acceptable on our side okay. if council wishes to make that motion. It's uh, uh, it's a matter of where we tag the invoice to. Uh, Mr. Still Laura, Tana Tabor it, Pool, right? Basically, <clears throat> he's not protesting too much, so I think that motion is <laughs> fairly suitable, and and we can certainly you know append it to that. Still Tana Tabor Pool money, whichever. But anyway. oh yes, it's all it's, so, we have all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Demanded it from the taxpayer to use as council would like to use it. And so okay. uh, whether it's council's discretionary fund or the uh, recreation budget, it's it's coming from the same spot. Okay, all right, fair enough. All right, Councillor Stravis. Your Worship, just a, a little footnote to that. Uh, there's a little note there that currently there's only $2,600 remaining in the council discretionary fund anyway, so that would drop it down to $100. So that would, li that would limit... So I, I think it's a good motion because if something does come up, we, st we still have access to $2,500. All right, okay, once again, motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously, thank you. Uh, all right, item 6.3, fencing at signature point request, Mr. Armfield. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago we received a letter from the uh, Signature Point Condominium Association uh, requesting that the town participate in the cost of a fence that they would like to get built um, in between uh, their development and the curling rink. I'm bringing that forward to Council for your consideration. You can see the recommended motion there from administration. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? No questions whatsoever? Councillor Towns. Is there a particular reason they're asking the town to participate in this? Uh, administration is not aware of the reasoning why the letter was sent, so could not speak to why they have asked. Right. Any other questions? Councillor Bruin. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I drove by there the other day and uh, uh, read the recommendation here, but uh, afraid I'd have to support building a fence there, sharing the cost with the uh, the senior complex there. Uh, because of garbage that blows across the uh, parking lot and whatnot, if we had a fence there, perhaps it would catch it and save it from getting into the trees. So I would vote in favor of, of sharing the cost of this fence. Councillor well, Strabas. Your Worship, as much as I understand their dilemma over there, this really opens up a whole can of worms for the town, um, for any facility or any private property that's alongside town property, then becomes open to this type of a of a request, and th this could open up a can of, of 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 worms that we probably don't want to go down because of that. And I appreciate the fact that that uh, what they want, and, and I, I realize there's some unique situations there. Um, you know, they have also uh, trimmed up the bottom of those trees so that you can see through there. So, um, you, you know, um, uh, I cannot support this because of the implications it could give down the road. You do it for one association, there's gonna be requests for, for uh, other groups, other private properties to come through. That's a uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Strohs, I think uh, the property owner is responsible for the garbage on their property and it's up to them to contain it. And I think in this case uh, we have that issue here that uh, the traffic and the garbage that's left by certain people in that parking lot is blowing onto their property and I think by putting the fence up there we can justify that. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Garner? I, I agree with fully with Councillor Bruin and I think that old adage that goes uh, good fences make good neighbors and I, I think it behooves us to do this I mean it's not a large amount of money but you've got to understand that's a unique uh, position where we're neighboring with those people and we all know that there's an ongoing problem there with littering we know that for a fact and uh, at any given day that garbage can blow onto these people's property, and I think that it behooves us to be good right. neighbors with them. Thank you. Just a question. Has there ever been any fence, sir, Mr. Armfield, that you're aware of? Not to the degree and sophistication of what they are uh, proposing. I believe there I was a post and chain fence okay. there. Like It would be before my time, but the post still exists. Post, existed. chain, post, chain thing. Yeah, so okay. So I would assume that existed at one point. Not really a fence, a divider if that yeah. best, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. Councillor Temps. I happen to agree with Councillor Strobus. This is going to open a big can of worms. Anybody that's bordering on our uh, municipal property that wants a fence because it's unsightly. And if we go to our industrial park, we have boulevards along the road and fences along the road and 20 feet that is town-owned property that have been maintained by the property owners, probably mostly because they don't own it, but they use it. And I think we are open a big can of worms here that is, is not necessarily the town's problem. They're requesting that we do this for aesthetics, but I don't think that aesthetics is going to help the problem that they're really trying to deal with. And that's, that's the fact that that parking lot is, is packed full of cars and, and people socializing. And I think, uh, I think it'd be wrong for us to participate in building a fence to separate that, this from that when we have all kinds of uh, areas in this town that is just going to keep coming and coming and coming if we do this. Just a question for administration. <clears throat> um, just going from memory, but... In any residential location, you're required to split the fencing with your neighbor, right? East or west, I don't remember which. Is it not? Is that is that not accurate somewhere? Residential anyway. From a town policy perspective or a town directive perspective, that we have nothing uh, that's been enshrined in policy or bylaw it, that um, directs that sort of so relationship. So I'm just... Ah, oh, boy, I'm just trying to go from memory. It seems to me. So that's that's not accurate what I'm saying, that, that you're, which, with whatever side you're on, you're required to split the fence with your neighbor if you're both willing, basically. I don't know if there's any obligation, but uh, is, is that not a bylaw related to residential? That's what I'm getting at. 
Not in. I oh, never year. encountered anything like that okay. within the current books of the town of Tabor that would have something like that. Does because okay. no I guess one, I'm looking to public works and planning and no. I believe no. I've done that at some point. <laughs> so maybe that was just a good neighbor thing. I don't know, but but there's nothing on the books as far as it's not a common thing anywhere. Okay, Councillor Bruin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, as far as I'm aware, you if you want a fence between your property, you're responsible for paying for it. And if your neighbor doesn't want to, it's tough luck. Um, I'm going back to um, if someone owns a lot and garbage from their lot is blowing onto the neighbor's lot, it is not the neighbor's lot responsible to put up the fence. It's actually the <coughs> guy that's polluting the lot that's responsible for a fence. And I, I firmly believe we should split the cost with this. Councillor Becker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is an interesting discussion. Uh, I, I believe the uh, precedent setting that's mentioned by Councillor Strovers and Councillor Tams, I think, is insignificant. I think this is a very unique situation. These people have put up with the Corn Fest for 25 years, as long as the building's been there with the noises and the music and the area, area complaint, I believe. They've been good neighbors to us. Let's be good neighbors to them, and I would support a split cost. <clears throat> All right, Councilor Stravos. Worship, just a footnote. I live on a golf course. I get golf balls bounce off my house and break windows. Those people bought in that situation knowing that Cornfest has been there. So, you know, as, as much as, as we want to be good neighbors about this whole thing, they bought in an area where it was adjacent to a parking lot where Cornfest parking, different things happen. So, you know what? I don't. I don't fly that that conversation. It just doesn't make sense. They couldn't have bought there. They could have. They could have bought someplace else. Sir Bruin. It's just. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me to build on a golf course where you can be hit by golf balls every day. But I don't think that's really the same as garbage blowing into your property. So I All right. still stand by my my position on this. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Garner? I'm prepared to make a motion at this time. All right. The council directs administration to enter into a 50-50 cost sharing agreement with the Signature Point Homeowners Association to have fence constructed between their property and the Tabor Curling Club parking lot for a maximum of $3,375, excluding GST with funding to come from general revenues. And I would like this vote recorded. Mr. Armfield. General revenues is not a specific enough designation for where the funding could come from, Mr. Mayor. We need uh, right, fair uh, enough. And uh, I might have to call Mr. Orwa off the bench to give me advice <laughs> on exactly right. what would be Mr. specific Orwa? enough. No, I, I think, uh, please, please, please talk to the microphone. Funding purposes, we have to be very specific where the money is coming from, and it gives us easy time because these are line items that we need to look at. So general revenue is so amorphous that I wouldn't know exactly where to get that money from. So uh, uh, yes, exactly, and Mr. Roy. In all, all fairness, I'm not sure unless I've missed something. Have we ever use general revenues it, to, to uh, provide. Mr. Mayor and Council, yes. with a bit more uh, information, a, a catchphrase that could work with would be operating reserves, I, I, Mr. Orwa. Yes, if it's anything to do with the operating side, then operating reserves would be the best source to get money from. And Mr. Orwa, we're not going to capitalize this because of the nature of the expense. No. So it would be operating. Mr. Garner. Yeah, I can change that to read from. Uh, general revenues to operating rep reserves. All right, thank you. Fair enough. That's correct. All right, motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. On to item 6.4, 2020 street improvements, tender award, Mr. Arnfield. Yes, Mr. Shear is here to uh, talk about the award of the street improvement plan. Great, thank you, Mr. Shear. So we had an excellent tender. Um, basically, it's a lot of asphalt and concrete removal, more asphalt this year because we're seeing more and more blowouts, things like that. I included a bunch of locations where we'll be repairing items, sidewalks, things like that, for council's review. 
But McNally was a low contractor. We all know they're doing the 56th Avenue project, so they came in quite low, left 100,000 on the table. So at this time, we recommend that council moves forward with this project because it is very important to maintain our roads and sidewalks for safety. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? Councilor Stravos? Worship, I just want to commend uh, this to administration. Just want to commend administration that the plans and, 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 the, and the documentation that goes with this is really, you know, exponential. It, you know, it just lays things out where, where the areas are and whatnot. Administration did a, did a great job with this. And to that, I, I, I thank them very much for you know, having MPE or however it was, was done, because it, it really lays things out positively for us. Thank you. And we should point out this is where the savings are. If you can see, we had 675 budgeted for this year. Uh, really, the project's probably going to come in about 550, so there'd be a good saving for council. Absolutely. All right. Any questions arising? Someone prepared to make that motion? Councilor Stravas? Yes, Your Worship, I'll make the motion that uh, council awards council award the 2020 street improvements tender to McNally Contractors Limited for the amount of $568,218.97 in, inclusive of GST with funds to, from the 2020 capital budget. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried now. Thank you. Item 6.5, uh, Regional Recovery Task Force. Mr. Armfield. As Council um, and Mr. Young is approaching, and that's perfect timing, uh, that we've been involved, Council will note that we've been involved in, uh, in the Southern Alberta COVID Recovery Task Force uh, over the last few months, and Mr. Young is here to give us an update on that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Young. Good afternoon, Mayor Prokop Good and afternoon. Council. Uh, so today I just wanted to provide you a bit of an update on the Recovery Task Force. As Mr. Armfeld said, uh, Tabor Economic Development has been heavily involved in this, working with our regional economic development partners through from Lethbridge, South Grove, Coaldale, and all the places in between. Um, so just to start, I have a few stats just to put into context some of what our business community is going through, and this is as of last Friday, July 17th, and we're using the Stats Canada Lethbridge Medicine Hat region for what I'm talking about here. So in the last 30 days, more people have searched for work, up by about 1% as compared to the five months previous, which triggered a increase in local participation rate. So this signs an indication of some optimism that suggests perhaps workers are sensing more opportunities are available as the relaunch continues. While the unemployment rate continued its upwards trend, uh, is now increased for six consecutive months in our region, it is important to keep in mind excuse me, that local figures remain comparatively low. So the Lethbridge Medicine Hat uh, region is the sixth lowest unemployment rate in Canada, which is quite, quite surprising. And on the positive side, employment in healthcare and social assistance continues to soar, and construction employment was up by about 10% in June. Some of that can be attributed to, you know, seasonal construction is starting to take off, but it's also a good sign that we're seeing some good recovery in this region. Having said that, though, there is still some cause for concern. Uh, the employment, re re employment rate remains down by about 10.5% compared to February of this year, and an unemployment rate is still rising and part-time employment continues to almost evaporate. Uh, I've seen some numbers, about 20 to 30% of part-time jobs have disappeared in the last four months in our region, which is quite concerning. The also, the other concerning piece for our region is uh, manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing employment has been really hit hard by the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've seen about 2,400 jobs lost in that sector in our region since February, so that's quite significant. So what the Re Recovery Task Force is doing and what can be done We've undertaken several surveys of the business community in the region to try and gauge where the priorities are for the business community. So at the start of the pandemic, the number one concern of businesses was cash flow. Um, so there's been a lot of federal and provincial programs to assist with cash flow and also some council decisions you know, to defer utility payments, tax payments, things like that has certainly helped with cash flow. But as the pandemic has now continued and we're into recovery and the relaunch, the number one issue we're hearing from businesses in this region is about consumer confidence. So restaurants and businesses that had to close, gyms, they're now reopening, but the issue they're facing is people aren't going back to the businesses as much as they used to. Um, a key piece of this rests with the businesses being able to prove they're taking the necessary steps to provide a safe 
and healthy environment for workers and customers. And so what the task force has done is we've created a list of regional suppliers of PPE and have really tried to push that out to businesses of where they can find PPE equipment, uh, you know, get hand sanitizer, masks, those type of things, and try and source that locally to also support other local businesses. Uh, we've shared it through our town websites, we've shared it through social media, places like that. And I'd encourage if you, you know, hear from any businesses yourselves that are looking for that, to send them our way and we'll provide them with that information of where they can find PPE. We've also created a kind of success story and best practices page on the Regional Recovery Task Force website that um, just tells some of the really cool stories of how some of the businesses are meeting these challenges and kind of the hope is to get people thinking that yes, it is safe to go back to some of these businesses. Businesses are taking the pandemic seriously and it's safe to go back. Another piece related to that is getting people back into local shops is people have become even more reliant on the um, on online shopping and the fears of small real retailers is that they're not going to be able to compete in this online market. So one of the key pieces we're going to have to work on the next few months is really promoting that shop local idea, getting people back into the local businesses to try and stop everyone just buying everything you know on the big online retail stores. We're also working on a grant for a project for what we're calling a back to work project. And that's through the workforce retention committee, which I, I sit on that committee through the task force. And the goal is to address some short and long-term labor challenges. And this will be done by matching products and services offered by companies who have say lost some of their big clients due to the downturn or other you know, you know, issues and matching businesses in the region that can provide those services or are needing services or products from those companies. So really trying to do some import replacement and things like that. Uh, where we've got the grant in for um, one of the labor market partnership programs. And if it's unsuccessful through there, we have other grant programs we will apply for, hoping to get that project up and running in the fall. A few other of the subgroups in the task force are working on webinars, social, social support, emotional support, advocacy, things like that. But basically the task force, we're trying to do all that we can to support the business community here. And I would encourage council that if uh, any businesses are approaching you and having issues with the recovery, please uh, send them our way to Tabor Economic Development so that we can provide them with some more information and support however we can. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Young? Councilor Strauss. It's your worship through to uh, Ben here. Uh, this this PP, PPE procurement database that you have, are, I assume you're going to be doing something like this for, for Tabor, um, where these products can be reached here in Tabor? We could. Uh, this was done kind of on a regional basis, so basically it, whatever could be sourced in, in throughout the region. And if there's other specific ones within Tabor that aren't on the list, I can certainly add them to that. And you know, it could be a direction that we could take on making our Tabor specific list, but that would be up to. Council. Oh, because what I see here is, is all Lethbridge type uh, businesses that are on here for you know uh, shields and uh, screens and uh, different items. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure that uh, that we could put it on our own website. You know, the same type of information where people can reach this. Who's what other businesses in town that have done this already, and where these sanitizers and where these type of plastic shields can be gotten locally rather than because I mean this here this if you look at this I mean it, it leads you to, to Lethbridge to to procure this this these items and there's there's a lot of these type of things that that can be you know procured right here yeah, and sorry just through that we did reach out to many businesses throughout the region it was kind of put through Twitter and Facebook and all like on town website as well asking for if any businesses had these products so we certainly can fill in the gaps if there's gaps for sure Great. any other questions Someone prepared to make a motion. Councilor Bruin. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll make the motion that the council accepts the Lethbridge Regional Recovery Task Force update as information. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 6.6 .6, Tabor and District Museums, Museum Society requests. Mr. Armfield. Yes, yeah, probably about a month ago now, based on the date of the letter, there was a request come from the museum board uh, requesting expansion of their space into the Chamber of Commerce space uh, if and when the Chamber of Commerce moves out to their new building. Uh, so looking for a response from Council back to the Museum Society. All right. Thank you. Councillor Stravis. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I, I really understand and realize that, that the museum is in quite cramped uh, corner there. Um, 
you know, and, and I, I think probably um, it, it would make more sense for us to to uh, work with them and find them a larger, more um, visible location rather than than this site here. This this is it's it's difficult to to get in and, and, and get at and and I know that they they've seen that site coming available so they're jumping on it but I wonder if, if we shouldn't evaluate and um, you know with with Tabor and District Chamber of Commerce and see if there's some spaces available there or we don't know what's going to happen on another property before because there's there's certainly a, a there's certainly is some options that have come available you know for us and um, you know if, if you put together uh, I mean, we're in the irrigation district. I mean, if you put together the sugar beet growers, the irrigation, uh, the corn people, the the potato growers, I'm I'm sure that that we could we could make some pretty neat uh, museum displays uh, if we partner with all those uh, all those entities in this area here, rather than just allocate uh, you know a, a, a tight little corner there for them. And I think it would it would take us. It would uh, be good for us to take a look, good hard look at this to see if we can't get more exposure for the for the museum. All right, thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Bruin? Um, Mr. Mayor, I uh, I sit on the museum committee, but um, speaking on behalf of myself, not the committee, I'd love to see it uh, incorporated somehow into the uh, chamber building, the new chamber building, uh, visible from the highway, and uh, it would be nice to see it. Uh, so it's not so hidden in the corner. I would support definitely looking into something where we could incorporate it into that building. All right. Uh, just a question for Councilor Brewer. Are you still meeting regular or when yes. was the last you, you are? We met, uh, we've had one meeting since the COVID just recently. Okay. All right, fair enough. Good, thank you. <coughs> Councilor Beckering. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, you know, the suggestion bears some some thought, I believe, but I think it's kind of a long term, longer term process uh, regarding the Chamber of Commerce new location to put it there, I think makes a lot of sense, but it's not our building. So we should, we should have a discussion with the Chamber of Commerce first before we do that. It's their building. So I'm not opposed to uh, given that space that's going to be vacated to them. We can always change our mind, right? When they go to a different place. But I think that's a, and if you want to amalgamate the potato growers, sugar beet growers, and the corn growers, and oh boy, that's a big, big project, big job, big bucks. Thank you. Councillor Stromas. Just for clarification, we wouldn't amalgamate them all together. We would just get them to participate in, in some history, you know, behind all their different organizations in the area. All right. Any other questions? Uh, just uh, a couple comments on my end. I, I would agree with Councillor Becker and also that uh, I don't know that the chamber spelled out exactly what they're looking to put in that particular new location. Mr. Herfeld? Yeah, no, not to interrupt you, I just wanted to make sure that I got into queue um, as a reminder of Council uh, that there has been never a motion made directing administration to work with the Chamber of Commerce to integrate any sort of museum concept into that building. And the Chamber of Commerce is quite far down the path with regards to their final plans for that building. And I would suspect that we would see that uh, come to MPC within the next month or two, Miss Monks, is that reasonable? Yeah, so we've very successfully worked with the Chamber to get a site plan and a concept for that building based off of Council's previous motions. Right. And so we are nearly at the finish line with the Chamber uh, and okay. being prepared to bring that to MPC for their consideration. So. Um, just wanting to add that note to Council's considerations uh, related to this discussion. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely, that, that's important information. That's, that's good to know, for sure. Any other questions arising? Someone prepared to make a motion? <laughs> Councillor Beckering. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Make a motion then that Council acknowledges and thanks the Tabor and District Museum Society Board for their request for additional space and agrees to evaluate the museum expansion possibilities into the existing Tabor and District Chamber of Commerce space once the requested space becomes available. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 6.7, Weed Control Act Municipal Inspector Appointment. Mr. Ernfeld. 
Yes, to the Mayor and Council, uh, the police service has uh, increased their complement of staff and related to that uh, and, and allowing that uh, new constable to be able to do his full suite of duties, uh, Council needs to go through the uh, administrative step of designating him as a weed inspector. So that's what this one's about, please. All right, thank you. Any questions related? Someone prepared to make that motion? Anyone? Councillor Barone. Uh, Ms. Mayor, I'll make the motion that Council appoints Constable Ted Boychuk of the Tabor Police Service under the Wheat Control Act of Alberta as Municipal Inspector of the Town of Tabor to carry out this act and regulations within the municipality. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Councillor Tams, you had a question? Uh, yeah, um, by appointing a weed inspector, do they have to have a certification or is it just uh, an individual that has a book? <clears throat> This individual would not be spraying any weeds uh, to council. This is an individual that is ex exactly right, has a book and able to uh, enforce on weed infractions, but not actually be the, a sprayer. Thank you. All right. Once again, motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Chair Nanosi. Item 6.8, whistleblower hotline, ethics alert, Mr. Armfield. <clears throat> Yeah, well, this might seem like it's uh, um, potentially has a negative connotation to it. Uh, I don't actually look at it that way. We did. There is a call that you can see that uh, council is going to um, adopt by a motion. Hopefully, that uh, recognizing that there was a call to the uh, whistleblower ethics hotline. Um, you know, I'm very. Uh, staff members will know that I'm very vocal that uh, I do not expect people come to come to work here and experience harassment and intimidation and I say at any opportunity that I get to staff that if they are experiencing that or if they ever experience it uh, it is my desire that they go to speak to their manager or they go to the harassment committee or they go to the Tabor Police Service or they go and they call the ethics hotline if they want to remain completely anonymous and then we get that feedback. So in this particular instance, uh, we do know enough about these details. I'm willing to be um, transparent uh, within the bounds of confidentiality on this matter. We have been working very hard to break down the barriers or get rid of the silos, you might say, uh, between our public works department and our rec department. And um, while council may not know, but operationally we certainly do, that there is a very different approach to working with public works employees than working with recreation employees. That's simply a matter of, you can look into the gallery and see who the directors are of those two departments and probably appreciate what I'm saying to you. So as we break down those barriers and get these people working together in a much more team environment, we are going to encounter cultural difficulties um, within those departments. And not making light of this, I'm very happy that the employee phoned and made us aware of this. And we have identified this as a area of improvement as we continue to work closer together across those departments. So um, that is why there is a call into the uh, whistleblower hotline and very happy that actually it occurred. Thank you. Any questions arising? Someone prepared to make that motion? Councillor Garner. I make that motion, Your Worship. The Council accepts the statistical report from MNP LLP regarding the whistleblower hotline ethics alert for the period of April 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2020 for information purposes only. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried now, thank you. Item 6.9, Tabor Municipal Police Commission reports. Mr. Armfield. Now we now get into the report section of our agenda. Uh, as the Secretary of the Police Commission, if Council has any questions here on this one, I can get you back the answers you're looking for. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? Someone prepared to make that motion? Councillor Bruin. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have an observation, not to motion yet, but uh, in our 2020 capital budget, we budgeted for some uh, replacing the carpet in the bullpen. And that carpet has been delayed till 21, but it's coming to the point now where it's getting dangerous with the, uh, the rolls in the carpet. So I think it's something we have to look at as a council, as an expense we're going to have to look at. All right. Um, 
Well, Mr. Arfield, I think that creates a little difficulty. That's uh, that's a nice to know thing, but that's really not related at the moment with this report, correct? So yeah, I br guess, uh, but we can certainly, I guess, uh, would that be more appropriate to bring that up at uh, the, the following meeting, the next meeting, if that's changed? I don't know. I think what Council Bruin is saying, something's changed since we made that decision, right? Well, what I'm saying is the carpet's getting in worse shape and it's getting to be a hazard. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. In your mind, Mr. Arfield, is that uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, the Student Council, similarly as the police carbines came forward, um, they had worn out and they were in need of right. replacement. I would trust the Chief of Bella would take the same process with regards to any renovations that needed to occur within the Tabor Police Service building. Uh, uh, his as operational as I, area. As I recall, that was not a major uh, fix either, was it? I, I believe we took it out, as you said, Councilor Broome, but it wasn't a major expense, correct? Again, I, I hate to say how things have deteriorated <laughs> from between yeah. now and then, but uh, I was just talking about the expense yeah. expenditure. I don't think it's a and, major. And honestly, expense. I don't have that detail in front of me. I, yeah. I would just rely on Chief Abella to bring that forward to, as in due course Mr. as Brew? he needed to. Mayor. Okay, sir. Who's first? Mayor, Mayor, Towns. I prepare to make a motion that Council accepts the Tabor Municipal Police Commission report for information. All right. Thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Karen Nows, thank you. All right, on to uh, item 610, department reports. I'll just go through them individually. If you have any questions, please stop me accordingly. First off, public works treatment of facilities reports. Engineering and public works, recreation department, finance activity report. Fire Department report, Administrative Services report, Councillor Stravas. Yes, uh, Your Worship, I, I just have a question here on the activity report for Tabor Memorial Gardens. That uh, uh, there's a public concerns. There was two of them. Could could we be un enlightened as what kind of concerns they were? Ms. Van Ham, are you available to speak to that? Uh, yes, good afternoon, Mayor Council. The specifics can uh, be supplied in confidence, if you'd like, Councillor Strollis. So, Ms. Van Ham just indicated that uh, in confidence, the uh, details could be discussed. It's a confidential motion, uh, sorry, a confidential motion, a confidential item uh, that occurred uh, with regards to a uh, FOIP situation for um, the purchase and the arrangements of um, who had pre-purchased grave uh, grave sites, and then uh, what has happened uh, in between uh, the purchase and uh, some passing. Follow up. I, I was just wondering if this was about the state of the cemetery or, or anything like that. But if it's, I you know that that's fine. That's I didn't realize it was of a FOIP nature. Uh, yeah, to, Keep up the cemetery at the moment. Those are another item relating to Councillor Strollis. Sorry, we missed that, that uh, yeah. Miss Van Ham. Um, uh, those are not in regards to the house of the cemetery, those particular items. Yes, to Council, these are not related to the upkeep of the cemetery. They're, they have to do with uh, um, what plots people have purchased and um, what their expectations were with regards to uh, uh, their loved ones that were designated for those plots. All right. Thank you. Okay, so let's get that covered, Councilor Travis. Yes. All right, uh, on to Planning and Economic Development Report. Councilor Travis. Yes, Your Worship, just a, again a question to administration here. Uh, there's there's a note here, and I know this is kind of a source point point with all of us here, but it's in re relation to, and I'll just read it out, continuing collaboration with Westview, Westview developer to register phase six and have the pond lands provided to the town. Um, levies will be uh, delivered and endorsement executed. So uh, am I gathering that uh, some more of that pond property is going to be turned over to the town? Mr. Mayor to Council, if I may jump in. We uh, certainly, with regards to Ms. Monks's work, she's had a 
very successful great week last week uh, with regards to her efforts in working with uh, the Westview developer where we have settled on the finalization of the Westview pond is taking everything from the high water mark um, below so with regards to the final subdivision of Westview uh, around the pond to the north that was not within the town ownership we have worked with the developer to uh, have what is essentially the storm pond and the storm pond only subdivided such that public works can do their work with regards to internal to that storm pond. We strategically and purposefully left out the areas which require landscaping around the north side of the Westview storm pond. Your administration is not interested in getting into a situation with a developer where it comes back to us where now we have to develop that area because we have taken it as park space. We are of the opinion that that area must remain within the developer's ownership until he is ready to subdivide that and finish off that park space um, based off of his development revenue, not tax revenue. And that is the way that we can make sure that that happens. Thank you for the clarification. All right, thank you. And on to the CAO activity reports. No other questions. Some are prepared to make that motion. I do need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Officer Bruin. I'll make the motion that council accepts the department reports for information. All right. Thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carry now. Thank you. On to item 611 Mayor and Councilor reports. Councilor Bickering. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nothing to report. Great. Thank you. Councillor Thames. Mr. Mayor, nothing to report. Thank you. Councillor Garner. Uh, nothing new to report. Thank you. Councillor Shamos. Yes, Your Worship. Um, I'm a new appointee to the Tabor and District Candy Bus, and, and we've had a couple of meetings. They've uh, obviously had some bumps in the road with uh, um, between the COVID and, and losing some board members um, and graciously uh, we uh, had a meeting with administration and they've graciously uh, ex uh, accepted a, an invite to uh, to have the town help them out more when it comes to some of their uh, their bylaws and uh, and uh, helping them get back on the ground the bus is still not uh, out there uh, running uh, there's a, there's a whole new set of guidelines that got to be f uh, followed. The uh, drivers have to be retrained uh, to uh, to the new COVID standards. Uh, um, you know, even that Humboldt bus accident a couple of years ago has affected um, their uh, their running of the bus. It comes under new classification, and there's there's a whole bunch of stringent. Uh, um, regulations that have to be followed so they're uh, they're definitely in uh, in a in a pickle and they're working through it and administration here has uh, has graciously helped uh, stood up and, and going to help out so to that uh, I thank administration for coming forth to helping an organization that's that's struggling because the handy bus association is is definitely a valued uh, uh, commodity in our in our uh, community here transporting people around Thanks again. All right, thank you. Councillor Bruin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was very honored and proud to be part of the Highway 3 Twinning Committee when Mr. Premier Jason Kenney came down last week and announced the twinning of the highway between Tabor and Burdett. It's a huge announcement for this uh, area and uh, as we're all aware, it's not too soon. And uh, I'd like to thank administration for the great job they did at such short notice, getting it all ready for the Premier. And uh, I heard nothing but compliments from the higher levels of government, the job we did. And uh, this may move on now to further twinning of the highway, we hope. So we're going to keep pushing as a committee to get it all finished. So I'd like to thank again the town for all the help with that. All right, thank you. And for myself, uh, I did participate in the Kennedy, Kennedy celebration. That was uh, a little bit different this year, but uh, uh, 
for the attendance we got. It was very well done, and I think very well appreciated and well received. <coughs> I also attended the uh, UCP Highway 329 announcement, and uh, yes, absolutely, thanks again to our town administration and, and Team Tabor, once again, for all they have done and uh, had some uh, um, very high praise from people involved with uh, the UCP government related to our involvement in that regard, and great to see that the uh, Highway 3 Twin Associate was successful with that venture. So that's great for Tabor and area and the Southern Alberta uh, all the way around. Uh, I also attended, or sorry, I did a, a live press release with uh, Minister Hunter related to the uh, $1.4 million commitment from the UCP government for our raw water pump station that can now start uh, later sometime this year. So that was another uh, big announcement and uh, big event for the town of Tabor. Also attended the Tabor Library with the Open Mic Entertainment last week. That was a lot of fun and uh, very well done by the Tabor Library and uh, participants involved. That would be my report. Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Tams. Mr. Mayor, move that council accepts the mayor and council's reports for information. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. And on to item 612, standing item, council requests. Any standing item, agenda items? Councilor Broom? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to uh, make note of the fact that the carpet in the police station is getting worn quite a lot and we may have to consider replacing that soon rather than later. Okay. And did you want to submit a motion in that I don't regard? know if a I think it's just more to make the council aware okay. that this will be coming up and uh, if anyone wants to have a look at it, I'm sure more than welcome to. Mr. Arnfield, clarify that would likely happen next meeting anyway, correct, with yeah. uh, Chief Abella or designate? I, Mr. Mayor, I leave it up to Chief Abel to run his world. Fair enough. So. All right. Thank you. And thanks for that information, Councillor Bruin, as well. Uh, any other standing item requests? We have some outstanding ones, that I believe, that are just still in the works, Mr. Armfield. There's nothing extraordinary, though. Yes, <coughs> that's correct. Um, the, due to a holiday and then, and actually two holidays, uh, uh, the item pertaining to Councillor Firth uh, will be coming back to the August agenda. Um, and then the one uh, just uh, with regards, there was not actually a rec board uh, meeting and not one coming until September, I believe that correct? For the rec board? There was one in Oh, but not another one until September. That's right. Yeah, so the, <coughs> yeah, the last item there, uh, we'll get back to council on that last item uh, in September. Okay, fair enough, thank you. All right, with that, we're just on to our delegations is next, so we uh, we can now break until 5 p.m. If we have a motion to break until 5 p.m. to uh, uh, adhere to our delegation and or reconvene at 5 p.m. Councillor Beckery. Yes, Mr. May also move adjourn motion. until 5 p.m. Motion on the table. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you.
that's a great part. <laughs> All right, can we reconvene the meeting, please? And move on to our delegations, item 7.1, uh, Tabor Dog Park, Mr. Arfield. Yes, I see Ms. Danielle Ulrich is in the audience, and if she'd like to step up and make her presentation, please. Ms. Ulrich, how are you today? Good, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. Good. Um, quick presentation, I'm just here to request that the town um, maybe see if there's some money laying around, a little bit of money laying around to put a shelter out at the dog park. Um, I've believe you have a copy of kind of what I'm thinking of for a shelter so it's nothing fancy it's just something that uh, people can use to get out of the sun out there you've got elderly people out there like the less chominies that are daily users of the park and you know him and others that are you know um, I don't think you want anybody out there in the sun using it regardless of elderly people so it's just something to help um, you know make it a, a usable park I also want to maybe point out that I don't know if you remember years ago when you used to have the dog agility trials at Cornfest. Um, I remember because I was actually competing in them with my dog back then. Um, so to look forward into the future, especially with no Cornfest this year, maybe it might be a great idea to put a little bit of money into that, even just for the shelter this year, because eventually you might want to consider using that as a dog agility demonstrations, anything like that for Cornfest. So I think instead of having at some point realizing that, oh shoot, this is a really great area, let's sink, but we don't have money. If you did a little bit now and a little bit later, at some point it would be a fantastic spot to have, you know, you've got your dog, dog 4-H club in town, you could have potential Cornfest agility, and again, just the daily users out there. So, so I'm just asking for a small <coughs> shelter to be put out there. That's all. All right, thank you. Any questions arising? May I ask? Oh, sorry. Sure. You, I ahead. would just also like to add that having said that, I would like this also put into the budget, you know, moving forward, the dog park itself. All right, Councillor Stralis. Yes, uh, Your Worship to uh, our delegation here. Um, so we've got a picture of this, of this shed here, and that's so people can stand in there out of, out of, the, out of the sun or the wind or whatever, okay? so. That what we have is actually what you're going to get for two thousand dollars. Okay, so I see some concerns with this here. Um, there, there's no benches in there for people to sit in. Okay, and I also see plywood, and I'm I'm wondering how uh, how long that would stand up in in the in our southern Alberta uh, weather. Um, it would I'm sure it would curl and wouldn't stand. Up. So I'm, I'm wondering that, uh, I like the idea and I, I fully understand what you're doing, but I think for if, if you're going to spend $2,000, you, you should have uh, a facility that's properly cladded and, and, and looked after because it, it'll just weather and become, it'll become quite a, an eyesore in, in just a couple of years. I do agree. Um, it does need a little bit more work on the exterior. It does come with the metal roof. Um, for seating inside, the ones down in Medicine Hat have just built a, and this is kind of where I got the idea from, they've just built a wooden bench. And I'm sure we could get any Joe Handyman or service club to go in and just build some seating in there. Um, and for the cladding on the side, I mean, yeah, ultimately it would be nice to have something done to it further, but, um, you know, whether it's a hitting up some of the service clubs to see if we can work a deal out with them or some future fundraising to get that done. All right, Councilor Strauss. Yes, Your Worship. So, I mean, as it sits here right now, I mean, I couldn't support the building that, that we have right here because of, of, of it. It would obviously take another thousand or two dollars to clad it properly, uh, put some benches inside. So they ask then, I mean, you've got a very minimal two thousand dollars, but it would it, it would have to probably, I don't know, to put some proper siding on it would probably be another couple thousand dollars on, on top of that to put the benches inside because uh, I like I said I I can't support it as as much as I'd, I'd like to be able to help you out, but I can't support it in its present state. It would need to be something a little a little more weather resistant. All right, thank you. Any other questions, 
Councillor Thames. Not a question, Mr. Mayor, but a comment. This did come through at the rec board, and the rec board, because there's a monetary value, had decided that uh, we'd ask Mr. All Mrs. Ulrich to come to council and, and explain what we're after. Um, the rec board is in favor of this, and although uh, after hearing Councillor Strovis' comments, I think that it it's, needs to be a little bit deeper than what we thought about, because you're right, if it's just plywood, it's going to weather. But because there was a monetary value, the, the rec board had suggested to come to council and deal it from there. But the rec board was in favor of putting a shelter out there. But after hearing Councillor Strovis' comments, we need to maybe rethink this a little bit. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anything else? I guess I just had a question. Oh, Councillor Bruni, Edwin? No, I, I echo what uh, Councillor Strovis, Councillor Tam says. I think it's it's most likely needed out there, but uh, if we're going to do it, we should do it right. It needs to be clad, and the flooring in the bottom should either be pea gravel or cement, because you're going to have to worry about that. And it has to be anchored very well, so it doesn't blow away into Saskatchewan in the winds. But uh, I think it's something we should get, maybe consider in the future, but not the way it sits as this. Just to clarify, I believe this is a UFA product, is it not? I think. I just, I don't know, maybe, Mr. Arnfield, is this a fair question? Is this something the town could do, something similar? Uh, in any capacity that you're aware of? From a construction perspective? Correct. Yes. Uh, we certainly could do it. Uh, I know that timing is always an issue when you when you choose to do right. things in a short term. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's certainly something that town staff could construct. Yeah, I do, I, you know, I'm not, a, not an expert in any building at all, but that to me looks really basic and... Uh, I don't know, it seems kind of pricey for that, <laughs> what I'm looking at. And maybe I'm out to lunch, but uh, uh, so I just, if there's a way the town could do something, maybe that's something a little more uh, fiscally uh, palatable that would be that much easier for us to deal with. And uh, is that something that, like you say, that, that's nothing out of sorts that we have done something, I don't want to say similar, but other projects for uh, build, builds with the town for different locations, correct? I, I would say not necessarily of this nature. Okay. Um, yeah, I hesitate to go too far because I'm not necessarily being asked <laughs> uh, specifics. But, uh, yeah, I guess I'm going back. Uh, 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 I was thinking of one, but anyway, I won't go there right at the moment. But, but um, so I, that, that was the question, like to, to do something that's suitable, suitable for the, the dog park needs and and something that the town could potentially handle uh, in some capacity at a uh, uh, much cheaper cost, I guess what I'm getting at. Your, your Worship, um, perhaps we could fashion a motion that the town could uh, price a, a facility out like this that is properly clad and, and goes on a, uh, on a cement base and can come back to us in, in a in a future motion if, if the rest of council would, would support something like that if that's uh, if we get some opinion whether I should fashion a motion in that respect or not. Councillor <clears throat> Thames. Agree with Councillor Strovis and then put it into the twenty twenty one budget, I would think would be the proper way to do it. In that case and we don't really need a motion then tonight if it's gonna be a budgetary item on a go forward basis then. Is that correct, Mr. Armfield? Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly council could enshrine that action through a motion or when we're preparing the 2021 uh, capital plan that it, you know, I'm sure we won't forget that one, Ms. Phillips, to, to add that to investigate what a, an actual stout structure would cost down there that's appropriate for the space and then work that into 2021 and bring it back to council's consideration at that time. Mr. Room? I just may add that the building you priced here, um, Actually, it's a very good price, and uh, I commend UFA for that. But by the time you build this with labor and everything else, you'd be probably that, if not more. Um, I definitely think it's something that's going to be needed out there in the future. And with our future plans, perhaps with 56 and the trout pond there, we may be able to incorporate this. Is my thoughts. All right. Any other questions? <coughs> I think, in all fairness, Miss Ulrich was uh, likely looking for something for 2020, I believe, right? Ideally. Perfect world. <laughs> Ideally, yeah, okay. Um, but I guess that's, that gives us some direction at the very least. And uh, 
Uh, and again, I don't know, like I said, if, if it's something the town can undertake and build something that much more solid and appropriate with uh, all the necessary amenities, all the better, right? So. Uh, could I just add one uh, point as well, is that Medicine Hat um, does not have a cement base on theirs. Now, if you want to put one on Tabor's, if and when that happens, that's fine. But just know that theirs is just on the ground, um, into the ground. There's no base or platform. Okay, fair enough. Great, thank you. So again, at this time, Mr. Arbor, we would not need a motion if we can look at, for, at a 2021 project. We could just incorporate that and or uh, some other form of uh, dog park budgetary items. Exactly, we'd bring that okay. forward as a capital item for 2021, if that's right. what council is envisioning. Okay, yeah. everybody's on board with that then? Okay, so for now, this is simply an information item for information purposes with that next uh, vision and step for 2021. Correct? <laughs> yes, if you're asking me for yes, some direction, uh, Mr. Mayor, that uh, is a suitable direction. If somebody okay. wants to fashion a motion thanking Ms. Ulrich for her presentation, uh, we yep. will make sure that we don't drop it out of 2021 and All we'll right. bring it back for your consideration. Perfect. And thank you much, uh, very much for your presentation, Ms. Ulrich. And I would just need a motion in that regard also. Councillor Thames. Yes, Mr. Mayor, move that we thank Ms. Daniel Ulrich for her presentation on the structure for the dog part and uh, instruct council to bring it to the 2021 budget for consideration. All right, thank you. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Chair Lamacy. Great, thank you. <coughs> All right, on to item 7-2, delegation Great Canadian Solar. Mr. Armfield. Yeah, I'm not sure if they, uh, Miss Monks, yeah, maybe just wave them down. That trail is going to be so well used. <laughs> All right, item 7.2, Great Canadian Solar, Mr. Arnfield. Yes, this uh, presentation actually started a while back. Uh, Mr. Papa Dennis and I were chatting uh, about opportunities in the solar world uh, based on his employment, and looks like it, it, Andrew Lundell, is that Mr. Lundell, uh, is here with him. I believe uh, you'll have to introduce yourself as your credentials with Great Canadian Solar, but they're here to talk to council about the opportunities in the solar industry. Please go ahead, gentlemen. All right, thank you. for giving us the opportunity to be here today uh, and thanks Rick for helping make it happen. Um, I'm just going to do a really quick presentation on a bit of a proposal we have. Um, my name is Andrew Lundell and um, I'm just going to do a really quick about me, about the company, our ability to deliver um, in what we do, uh, what we see as an opportunity for the town of Tabor. Um, some funding that's available and then any questions you might have. Uh, about me, noticed the world was changing uh, about 10 years ago a lot so I uh, went to Nate and studied alternative energy. Been doing that for six years um, and been involved in pretty much every aspect of uh, large-scale, small-scale solar PV projects since then. Um, my title would be uh, technical sales lead, design, IT support. I wear a lot of hats at the company presentations. <laughs> uh, about Great Canadian Solar, so we've been doing this since 2009, so almost 11 years now. We're engineering, procurement, construction, pretty much offering turnkey solutions for all things solar. Um, a fully certified team of experts. We've got 10 megawatts of experience in terms of microgen projects. Uh, for perspective, that's about installed 33,000 solar modules. Um, just recently, we've been in this area installing two large part of a, a larger operation installing two 
uh, quite large utility scale projects, which I'm sure everybody's aware of, the Vauxhall and Hall projects. Um, and we are currently in the process of developing a five megawatt solar farm for a large global corporation. Um, other services we have are EV chargers, drone surveying, and commissioning. And you can we have all of our safety certifications, core safety, Alberta construction safety, NAPSEP certified, we've got drone pilots, and asset. Um, ability to deliver, as I mentioned, Vauxhall and Hall, about 57 megawatts of solar. We we're integral to that project. Rick was on the site there. Um, the upcoming project that we are working on is kind of modeled on that right hand picture. Uh, again, for context, that's about 34 acres of land that's taking up. So, to the point, um, Tabor opportunity. We uh, feel that there's potential to, to make the town of Tabor net zero in terms of the, the, the facilities that the town of Tabor is operating. Um, benefits to that, we, we see lots of local employment opportunities. We think uh, doing somewhere in that sort of five to six megawatt project um, could employ up to probably 100 people, maybe more, for multiple months. Many local businesses could be involved, hotels, restaurants, um, lots of different contractors that are local. Um, so lots of employment opportunities. Uh, there's obviously emissions reductions, which I believe is going to become more and more important as time goes by in terms of from a regulatory perspective, not just a climate perspective. Um, and of course, financial savings, which is always a bit of a concern to, to councils. Um, we see the opportunity as maybe a solar farm, maybe some rooftop. I put the picture, the aerial picture of the building we're in right now uh, to show that, you know, there's some flat roof space there you could install solar on. Um, so it could be a mix of solar farm and rooftop uh, to, to get the town to net zero. Um, so what we would like to do is a, a feasibility study. Um, and to do that, one of the things we would start with is taking a, a sort of a deep dive or look at the kilowatt hour consumption of all the town's facilities. Um, and if you guys got that summed up already and you can share that with us, that'd be great. We can also take a look at all the electricity bills and and, uh, and put all that together for you. Um, and part of that could also be uh, doing mapping um, some rooftop space or some land uh, with the drone to uh, to make that part of the feasibility study. Essentially what the drone does is it'll detail pretty much down to centimeter resolution distances and elevations and all that kind of stuff. So it's extremely helpful in this industry. Um, Essentially, if you guys were to do a, a five megawatt farm, 1.5 million would be paid for by the Municipal Climate Change Actions, Action Center. Um, don't know how long that program is going to be around for, but uh, before I came out here today, I did some back of the envelope calculations, I guess, and you, pretty much a, a project that size would max out the uh, the funding that they're they're offering for municipalities. So, 1.5 million. It's, significant amount of money. And that's all I got. If there's any questions, happy to answer them. All right, great. Thank you, Tessa Brown. Can we go back to your last slide there, please? Now you're saying 1.5 million is available to us and the, how big of a plant will that build? Or in, not in megawatts, but households? Um, I'm going to have to do some quick calculations, <laughs> really quick. Thinking and looking at the overhead view of this building, if we were to cover this roof with solar panels, would it provide enough power for this building? Um, it's really hard to tell because you don't really look at it as square footage. It's more about what the behavior is inside the building in terms of how much what electrical appliances are running. So that really takes the first step is to look at the, the power bills and, and see what's happening. So roughly based on the average household consumption, 7,500 kilowatt hours per year. Um, a, side, a five megawatt solar farm would uh, offset enough energy for about 860 homes. Thank you very much. Sir Beckering. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mr. Lindell. A uh, five megawatt installation, besides any grant funding, what is the approximate per megawatt cost, please? You must have. I, I would budgetary that cost at about a dollar fifty a watt, so just over nine million dollars, between nine and ten million dollars. But per megawatt? No, oh, sorry. Per in this industry, we talk per watt installed. Um, so it'd be if you take uh, say 
6,500 million watts of DC solar power. And you times that by $1.50, fifty, you're going to get in that sort of close so, to the $10 million range. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my question is answered by saying it's approximately $2 million per megawatt. Yeah. Yeah. Probably less, but... Wind farms, how much per megawatt are they? I'm not involved in wind, yeah, sorry. But, but you know the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get back to you on that yeah. for sure. It's about 2.3 million per megawatt. Okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Stravos. Yes, Your Worship, to our, uh, our delegation here, I have a question that, so what hap what is, the, what is, a good couple of questions. So what is the, the life, uh, ex uh, life cycle of these, of these solar panels like in, in years? Um, so the, the manufacturer of the solar modules themselves guarantee them for 25 years in terms of their performance. Okay. So they degrade slightly year over year, about 0.3% per year. Um, they also offer a 10 to 15 year, um, just a manufacturer warranty based on defects and stuff like that. In reality, um, they could produce uh, usable, high quality energy for decades. Good, okay. So my next question is, what happens to these solar panels when they reach their life expectancy? What happens to them? That's a really good question. and. Because they last so long, that hasn't really become a super pressing issue yet. But um, just based on Google searching and stuff, there's a lot of people working on recycling the materials for these things. But because they're, they haven't really been, in a lot of places at a large scale, been put to end of life yet, it's not uh, the issue that everybody has been trying to solve right now. But people do know it's coming. You look at people like Elon Musk, who's heavily involved in solar. Um, he's putting a lot of money into trying to solve that problem. So is the European Union. Um, so, in short, I can't answer your question because it hasn't become an issue yet, but it will be an issue. Okay, so in a follow-up to that, 20-some years ago, we started with uh, windmills. And if you've ever been through Casper, Wyoming, they're digging huge holes to bury all this stuff now because they haven't been able to recycle these materials or anything. So in 25 years down the road, what are we going to do with these, these things? Like. You know, I mean, it, it's fine and dandy to, to build these windmills and these solar panels, but what do you do with the remnants after they fail and, and whatnot? Because have you been to Casper, Wyoming? No, I haven't. I have. <laughs> you don't want to see how those blades and, and yeah, tubes that's... are piled up. It's, it's, it's incredible yeah. to think that they're, that they're digging. And, of course, good for the county of, 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 of Casper that, that are bearing these things because they get money for it, eh? Yeah. That's, that's great, but... Uh, uh, there, there still is a, is a is a outcome to all of this here that we're going to have to deal with 25 years down the road, oh, and it's, and and that's part and partial of, of as as civic leaders we need to take into consideration. Um, it's you're saying that these things are going to be up lifespan of 25 years. Well, it, it's past 25 years for a lot of these solar panels already. So, like Andrew was saying, is it's uh, it could be 60 years, 70 years from now. So you're just assuming it's going to be 25 years. The warranty's up. The warranty's 25. Um, you've got to remember also with solar panels, there's no moving parts, unless, of course, you're looking at a tracking system. But we don't often recommend that just because of that. Um, and a lot of them aren't tested to minus 40 type weather. Um, so without the moving parts, you're getting a lot less maintenance issues and a lot less reason to replace them. So as long as they are still producing the energy, then um, then 25 years is, is the really low estimate. Um, but your point is is taken, and I just I maybe I'm an optimist. I think that those are becoming more and more of an issue as the world develops more and more renewable energy, um, and I I'm optimistic those problems can be solved. Uh, the other point I would make to that is if you look at life like full life cycle analysis of wind versus fossil fuel consumption, um, even when they're taking into account end of life disposal, um, you're still seeing a better return on your energy investment and financial investment with solar and wind. I, I believe. Maybe, maybe so. Um, I lost my train of thought. I had another. Uh, oh, I, I was going to say, uh, actually, if if you take a look at uh, at the uh, at the weather conditions here in southern Alberta, it's more conducive to these solar panels here than it is down in Arizona, where it's it's considerably hotter. So the life cycle here would probably be 
longer than that because that's that's kind of what what the that's basis correct. is is because the batteries these these panels they they tend to fry up in the heat you know whereas here our our temperatures are, are, are way way more moderate and you get the same result and they actually that. perform better in the cooler temperatures as well yes Councilor Towns I have a number of questions Mr. Mayor if, if you don't mind um, we're talking about DC solar panels direct current solar panels. So we're going to generate 12 volt electricity or maybe 24. Then we're going to put this together and we're going to have to have a battery pack in order and converters. Or are these 110 volt solar panels? There is no batteries. The, the batteries are a possible like, way to go, but these are straight grid connected systems. So you just have your solar panels, you have your inverters converting that DC to AC straight to the grid or straight to whatever load is closest. No storage. No storage. no storage. Storage is a possibility. It's just not what we would recommend at this time based on costs and available technology. So if we solar panel this roof and, and apply this entire building to solar system, are we still hooked to the grid? Yes. So I'm still paying. We're as a town we are still paying grid charge. We're still gonna pay the fixed no, asset charge. Cost. Absolutely. So all we're saving is the electrical charge of 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 a of a power bill. Everything else stays, all we're saving is electrical charge. I, I like to put it more as a variable charge, so I haven't seen your bills and I don't know what the details are, but the um, typically on a bill you'll see your energy charge, yes, so the electrical charge, you know, transmission and demand or distribution charge. Oftentimes the transmission charge is also a variable charge, so you're saving on that as well. Um, to, to make a long story short, consuming that energy on site is going to save you more money than exporting it to the grid. Um, but yeah, still no batteries involved. You're still connected. You can almost view the grid as your battery storage because you're anything excess, you're selling back to the grid and then you're going to buy it back when you need it. <coughs> Same Last question, Mr. Mayor. And what does it cost <coughs> to clean your solar panels annually? Um, honestly, we don't recommend cleaning them. You just wait for a good rainstorm to come through. The only time I've ever uh, really recommended cleaning them is when you get bird crap on them and it sticks to it. Um, Birds don't necessarily like it though. They they, get, they warm up a lot and they if they land on them. It's, it really depends on the slope of them as well. But um, we model in a two percent soiling loss uh, annually to our energy production estimate, um, and so that's based off real life numbers. Soiling, dust, whatever on the on the panels represents about a two percent loss per year. Where are your panels built then? Um, right now, anywhere but China. Or but China? <laughs> well, because there's duties still on uh, on uh, anything, any solar modules coming in from China, there's duties, so they're not competitive in this market. Um, one of the companies we deal with a lot uh, is called Canadian Solar. They are a Chinese company, but they actually manufacture in Ontario. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? Yeah, if I may, um, before a motion is made, um, I guess as a council, should we uh, go further further with this and divulge our our electrical usage and have a scenario drawn up, or what? What is the recommendation from administration on this? Well, I think you're looking at the two possibles, but uh, whether you go for one or two or or neither, but uh, um, they're kind of spelled out there. But I think. You're asking administration what? Yes, is, is this possible or is it good practice? To provide council with some information on what administration has done, we have been aware of this Municipal Climate Change Action Center grant for a while. Uh, and we have engaged uh, some studies going on uh, in the municipality right now. The evidence that we have, uh, that is borne out in the engineering work that we've done and the and the financial work that we've done is closer to uh, retrofitting for efficiencies. So we are accessing some of this grant money for retrofitting in some LED lighting in the uh, in, in our facilities. And we're also working on a combined heat and power unit grant for the aquatic center. So we, of course, we are well aware of what's happening grant-wise and are tapping into that. And when this, we probably are in this about a year now yeah on the combined heat and power unit uh, for the aquatic center and and so that's where um you know base basing it a little bit on you know where council was uh with their 
palatability uh, with regards to solar uh, versus combined heat and power. We um, went that direction, but it was awfully close. I can say that the return, uh, our return was clearly much better on the uh, adopting a new technology uh, and saving money on efficiencies uh, rather than introducing a new technology. And where we had scaled it to introduce that new technology, uh, the one that played out the best for us in that particular use was a combined heat and power unit for our aquatic center. Great, thank you. Councillor Towns, you bet. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move that Council accepts the Great Canadian Solar Limited presentation for information purposes and thanks the delegation for their presentation and directs administration to add solar into, into the consideration for the town's electrical infrastructure study. Is that right? Is that, that what you're doing? That enough information for administration to follow up on? Well, we would. It would be tough. We've already gone through that. Like this would be something new for us. Um, on the low-hanging fruit uh, of acquiring some of this grant money, uh, we determined that if internal efficiencies on retrofitting our lights and introducing a combined heat and power unit was the best way for the town to save money through the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre. So we, if a new, if Council is directing a new study, that's fine, but that would be new work that we would do uh, to see where this could fit in the future. In that case, Mr. Mayor, then I would like to make my motion. Council accepts the Great Canadian Solar Limited presentation for information purposes and thanks the delegation for their presentation. Motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried now. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, on to media inquiries. No Tabor Times here. Any indication from Tabor Times with any questions whatsoever? I have not gotten any text messages uh, with regards to any questions, so I'm taking the leap and saying there's no questions from okay. the media. Okay, perfect. Fair enough. Great. Then with that, I would just need a motion to move into closed session, please. I can make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Broom. Motion on the table. All in favor? Karen Nancy. Great, thank you. Can you uh, leave us everything? Um, well, sorry. 